and welcome to the Future Belongs to the Tropics uh, webinar series. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the, you know, where in the world you are from. This is the 16th webinar of the Future Belongs to the Tropics. Um, I would like to welcome you all. This webinar series celebrates the tropics and highlights the importance of science and technology in the region. It is also a lead up to the International Conference on Tropical Sciences, TROPSCI, that will be jointly organized by the Mahadi Science Award Foundation and the Academy of Sciences of Malaysia in October 2021. The Mahadi Science Award Foundation is a nonprofit seeking to encourage excellence in tropical scientific research that will bring direct benefits to countries in the tropics and the global community at large. Annually, we give out the Mahadeh Science Award in recognition of the best scientific contributions and innovations in solving problems of the tropics in four different categories, namely tropical medicine, tropical natural resources, tropical agriculture, and tropical engineering and architecture. The Academy of Sciences Malaysia is an independent organization representing the scientific minds of Malaysia. It carries out strategic studies that are independent, evidence-based, reliable, and timely for the benefit of all. Today's webinar is a joint effort between the Mahadi Science Award Foundation and the Academy of Sciences of Malaysia. The focus for today is a topic of great importance to the tropics, biodiversity loss. So before we begin, I would just like to remind the audience to remain on mute throughout. And if, and if at any point you'd like to ask questions, feel free to type during the Q&A session after the lecture. Now, without further ado, I'd like to invite the chair of our upcoming Tropside Conference, Professor Merita Mazatman, to give her welcome remarks, please. Thank you, Alia. And welcome everyone to our webinar series themed, The Future Belongs to the Tropics. This webinar series is a lead up to the International Conference on Tropical Sciences to be held in 25th to 27th October, 2021. It is co-organized by the Mahade Science Award Foundation and the Academy of Sciences Malaysia. So far, we have had 16 webinars in the series exploring various subjects of relevance to the tropics, mountains, forests, health, youth, mangroves, and even coffee. In the past, we have discussed the way forward for Malaysia to consolidate the, our biodiversity data, how we can protect our tropical forests and the unique biodiversity found in tropical mountains. Today, we, we will be focusing on a major issue in the tropics and in fact, globally, biodiversity loss. We celebrate the fact that the tropics host 80% of the world's biodiversity. Tropical forests support over two thirds of terrestrial biodiversity, despite covering only 7% of the global land surface. Similarly, tropical coral reefs, despite covering only 0.1% of, of the ocean floor, support a third of marine species. However, as pollution, global climate change, overpopulation and land degradation, among other pressures, continue to increase and affect the tropics, it is anticipated that much tropical biodiversity will be lost in the future. The situation, as you know, is quite dire, and the expression used biological annihilation by Professor Ceballo Gonzalez is really quite apt. So I believe that today's special discourse with Professor Ceballo uh, Gonzalez, an esteemed ecologist and conservationist, will shed light on the extent of biodiversity loss in the tropics. It is a great honor and privilege to have him with us uh, today. So to introduce, uh, without further ado, let me invite our moderator, Professor Tajuddin Abdullah, to introduce the webinar and our speaker. Dr. Tajuddin Abdullah is a fellow of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia. He is professor at the Faculty of Fisheries and Food Sciences, University of Malaysia Terengganu, UMT, and was former director of the Institute of Tropical Biodiversity and Sustainable Development at that university. He conducted his fieldworks in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand. Currently, he is active 
as an independent YouTuber, cool, huh? On uh, his channel, Touch Abdullah channel, uh, where he highlights various society, social environmental issues. So, as an expert in the field himself, I expect Professor Tajuddin to have his own insights on the subject. So, Professor Tajuddin, over to you. Thank you. Uh, Assalamualaikum dan terima kasih, uh, Prof. Uh, Mazlan. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Karado uh, Sebalus. He is the uh, world expert on the uh, ecology and conservation and well known for his work on the uh, theory as on the uh, practical part uh, on ecology and conservation. He is uh, well recognized on his uh, work on um, pattern of distribution, diversity, endemism, as well as um, extinction risk in vertebrate. So recently he published uh, on the uh, sixth extinction in PANAS, P-N-A-S. Uh, it's a very uh, highly regarded journal. Uh, Professor Sibalus was the first uh, scientist to publish the distribution of a complete group of organism. And he's well known for his contribution and understanding in the magnitude and impact of the sixth extinction. He is uh, uh, having a very long uh, mm -hmm. research on the small mammal, uh, ecology in the tropic for the last uh, 20 years and currently is the professor at the uh, universe, universe at the uh, uh, Institute of Ecology, uh, the Uni Universidad Nacional Autonoma de Mexico. I hope I pronounced it correctly. I'm sorry, apologize me. Um, uh, and uh, he has been the president of the uh, Mexican uh, Mammal Society and is uh, the member of both the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Art and Sciences. So we, we would like to welcome you and uh, uh, Selamat datang to Malaysia, that's our, in our local language. Uh, so uh, I would like you to, uh, to lecture us on uh, your your sixth extinction, and uh, what can be done to uh, arrest uh, the situation in the in the world? The, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, uh, uh, let me share my screen with you, and uh, I hope you can see it. Uh, good morning in Malaysia. In Mexico, we are uh, at night. You are in the future, you are on the fifth, here on the fourth. So we are still in work history and you are in the future. Well, anyway, I thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, um, today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, this issue on population and species losses, disease mass extinction, and the future of humanity. Uh, I'd like to, like, uh, to thank uh, uh, Rahim, Ahmad, and Ahad Navid for their kind invitation to the seminar to all of you for your kind introdu introduction and all of you to be here with us tonight, to today and tonight here. Many years ago, this uh, 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 nice conservation, important conservationist from the US, Aldo Leopold said that we live in a world of goons. And if you look around, that's what is happening. We, everywhere we look, there are wounds. The earth is full of wounds uh, made by uh, humans. Uh, uh, there are highways and dams and, and buildings and cities and crops and croplands and uh, anyway. So uh, let me tell you very briefly what I do in my work. I, I work at the National University of Mexico. I'm a scientist doing basic research. I love to do basic research. I love to go in the field to look at the animals, look, to look at patterns and processes. And uh, one thing that is a very, I think has been very critical for my understanding of the, these big patterns of extinction in the world is that I uh, work 
uh, doing basic science. Then I try I try to apply that science to understand these patterns and processes. And then I work. I do conservation in the field like this. A uh, jaguar. Here I have a jaguar with a radio collar. And then we do uh, public policy. We try to influence public 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 policy, but mm -hmm. in, both in Mexico and uh, uh, work at the world level. And my research, all my research, focus on the patterns and the processes of nature, and then the relevance of that information for conservation. Uh, you mentioned it here already that uh, uh, we, the, the, the most of the tropics, most of the uh, uh, diversity is found in the tropics. But what is uh, little known is that we have described probably only one or two percent of all the species that are known. I mean, what we know about biodiversity is relative, it's very, very minuscule. And all the animals you see here in these photographs are large mammals, relative, I mean, are mammals from small to large, uh, and all of them has been described in the last 15 years. For instance, here on the bottom, we have this, uh, what we call the, chinchi, the, the Peru chinchilla rat, and that was not only pro from pre prehistoric remains, and we find it alive in Machu Picchu in 2012. And this is the smallest deer uh, 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 on Earth. It was found in Burma. It's uh, only two kilograms. And then you have this new genus of monkey from Tanzania and many, many monkeys. More than 80 species of monkeys has been described since, 19, since, since 2000. And, uh, but what we know about biodiversity is really tiny. Most people will think, most scientists will think that there are around 100 million species of plants and animals and fungi. But if we include microorganisms, some of the uh, new papers have shown that there may be 1 billion species. <coughs> so what we know is very little. So that means that every time that we lost a species, uh, we, we lost a habitat, a coral reef, a tropical forest, a temperate forest, anyway, we're losing many species, many populations, and many unknown species. And as I say, most known and unknown species are found, found in the tropics and in the sea. So those areas have to be very critically important for conservation. And this is just an example of what was found in a single tree, in a single trip down to the, uh, uh, in the Pacific, they found more than 47 species, including the largest known uh, 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 animal on the sea, a 47 meter long uh, worm floating. Uh, but you see all kinds of animals and there are uh, fishes and uh, 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 sea yeah, stars and all kinds of uh, uh, creatures. And this is just a single tree. So the, the, they say that we know more about the uh, surface of Mars than of the uh, 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 surf of the uh, ocean floors. We know much better how is the surface of the of Mars than the surface of the uh, 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 sea on on Earth. So we have this extraordinary this extraordinary uh, uh, biodiversity, but unfortunately we are facing what we call in, a, in our 2070 paper, a biological annihilation. And biological annihilation is basically a fundamental loss, a fundamental problem that is an unprecedented loss of biodiversity. We call it a biological annihilation because when I was studying, I grew up in the 1970s and 1980s, a, a extinction was very selective large animals or very restricted species and so on, there were um, uh, vertebrates were more uh, endangered than invertebrates and animals were more endangered than plants. But as the time passes and in a very few decades, what we found is that all these uh, characteristics that will make some species more prone to extinction disappear on the, the influence, the massive influence of human impacts. So right now we're destroying small and large species, species, uh, uh, invertebrates and vertebrates, plants and animals and so on. So it's literally an annihilation. We are becoming a force that are annihilating, destroying most of the uh, wild plants and animals, fungi and microorganisms on earth. And that has dire consequences on our future.
well, we have these kind of things where we have uh, rhinos, single uh, individuals of rhinos, has to be protected by armed guards. And we know that the current situation, when I grew up uh, and when I studied in the 1970s and 1980s, there was one only one uh, at that time global environmental problem. It, it was the uh, depletion of the ozone layer. Now, every two, three months, there is a new paper in Science or Nature on the major journals showing a new problem, a new global problem. And we know now that uh, the, the root causes of the biodiversity loss are basically human population growth, that's the most important problem, then consumption and technology efficiency. Those three problems, see, had led to inequity, a big massive inequity between countries and in, in, within countries, and those are causing problems that are global and are, uh, pro are the most important challenge, one of the most important challenges for humanity. And our global climate disruption, habitat loss, overexploitation, emerging diseases like, like COVID, invasive species, toxification, pollution, and so on. And all of these are pushing, uh, are causing what we call the sixth mass extinction, the biological annihilation, and the loss of ecosystem services and goods. And I will explain very briefly what is this. So years ago, in the 19, in, in the 2010 or something, we published a paper in which we tried to uh, understand if we have entered the sixth mass extinction. And uh, fortunately for us, in 2011, somebody published the rates of extinctions in the last previous uh, maybe five, 10 million years. And this is very important because as we as scientists, we couldn't say it, it was we're experiencing right now is normal let's say it's a, 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 an extinction that is normal, or this is extraordinary. And what we found, and these are the two papers uh, related to that, that almost 1,000 species of vertebrate has become extinct in the last 500 years. But most of those species has become extinct in the last 100 years. And I would say even most of them has become extinct in the last three or four decades. So we know, we know scientists have called and uh, that I have understand that in the last uh, uh, 600 million years, and you can see in this graph, here are the uh, millions of years, and this is the, the cumulative no number of species, of families of uh, 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 large animals, animals that are visible from the sea. And what we can see in this graph is a couple of things. One, biodiversity has been steadily increased in the last uh, 600 million years. Uh, every every million years there are more species. In this particular moment, there, has, there are more species alive than ever in the last 600 million years. So it means that if we cause a massive extinction, we're causing, we're uh, pushing many more species than ever to extinction. And the other thing we, we have to see here is remember that in evolution, uh, uh, extinction and speciation are the two processes leading uh, uh, evolution. And under normal times, extinction is always, has been always less uh, 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 than speciation. So we have this increase in species extinction, in species uh, biodiversity. But in the last 600 million years, there has been five times, five times where there has been a mass extinction. And mass extinction is uh, being defined as a catastrophic loss of most species, 70% of most species of all plants and animals on earth, and uh, caused by a catastrophe, natural catastrophe, like the impact of an asteroid and a meteorite, uh, and uh, really fast in geological terms. And really fast in geological times means in, that it has occurred in hundreds of thousands or millions of years. That's fast in, 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 in geological term. So we have five mass extinction. The last one, and where we almost uh, more than 70%, 80% of the animals and plants disappear. Uh, the uh, 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 dinosaurs were lost. And what we have learned are three things. One is that mass extinction are not an essential part of evolution. There are accidents in evolution. Evolution could proceed without mass extinction. That's the first important thing. Second, the uh, uh, life on Earth has recovered after the mass extinction, but the recovery has taken 10, 15, 20 million years or more. So those are three, import three important things that we have to remember about mass extinction. 
So we published this paper in 2015, and we were very, very uh, lucky to have the data to show basically that the species that has been lost in this graph, we have 1,500 to the present, you know, and we have the cumulative number of species extinct according to IUCN, and this is underrepresented what has been a, 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 a accepted by IUCN, and regardless of that, what we can see here in the dotted line, if uh, the current extinction will be similar to what it has happened in the last few million years, all the lines should be below the dotted line. Uh, that is the background or normal extinction rate. But what we can see here is that all vertebrates and all mammals or birds and reptiles, amphibians and fishes together or uh, separated all have have massive, much more massive losses than the background extinction rate, meaning that we have entered the sixth mass extinction. And what we can see on the on the on the right is that the number of extinct species is almost perfectly correlated, is 0 0.0001 with population, human population uh, uh, growth. Um, what is important to understand from here is that the species that we lost in the last 100 years should have been lost in 10,000 years in normal times. And when we published this paper, some of our, our colleagues uh, say that was okay, but this will only apply to, to, to vertebrates. Unfortunately, unfortunately, they were wrong. And I say, unfortunately, because I will be incredibly happy if somebody would show that I was wrong, that our data wasn't as strong as it was. And uh, after we published this paper, there has been published uh, papers on invertebrates, on plants, and, and all kinds of groups, and all showing that the species that we have lost in the last 100 years or 200 years are massively uh, 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 above the normal extinction rates in some groups instead of being uh, the species that have been lost in 100 years, should have been lost in 100,000 years. So that's the scope of the problem. But one thing that we have emphasized is that extinction, putting too much, uh, too, too much emphasis on a species extinction is misleading because uh, 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 one is, once a species has become extinct, it's because all its population has become extinct. And, um, Unless we have this in mind, it wouldn't make sense to uh, try to save a species that are not endemic in a country. It doesn't matter if there are jaguars in Brazil, if jaguars become extinct in Mexico, because then the role that jaguars play in the structure and function of ecosystems in Mexico is gone, and the roles that jaguars play in providing ecosystem services are gone. So populations extinction are incredibly important because populations play, see, populations play the important role of providing services at the regional and the local levels. So in the case, for instance, of Malaysia, it doesn't matter that there are still rhinos in Sumatra, uh, uh, Sumatran rhinos, if they become extinct in Borneo, because the role that those animals play there is gone. Of one, this is one, pro, one point. And the second point is, as we start to lose so many populations, eventually we lose the species. So we published this paper, and, and what we uh, call it, is the, the bio, we define biological annihilation. And basically what you can see here, the idea is that we evaluate a, a, a population losses in uh, the animals, uh, large mammals, where we could get data. And what you can see here, basically, is the distribution of Africa, of uh, uh, African lions. It was gigantic. Now it is found in a much restricted area. There is one population here in the year forest in India. Uh, and even this range, this, uh, I, I made this, uh, well, the, 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 this map is from uh, uh, 10 years ago. Now instead of 34,000 lions, there are only 20, 20 21,000 lions. Who will think 20 or 50 or 40 years ago that lions will become in danger with extinction? Who will think that hippos will be in danger with extinction? Who will think that giraffes 
who would think that uh, Asian elephants, who would think that Vanteng, who would think that uh, so many animals, uh, tigers, even tigers in the 1960s, in the 1950s, there were still thousands of tigers. So what we're looking is all these uh, species are losing geographic ranges and are losing population and we're pushing them to extinction. And what we have to understand is because of the tropics has more, more species, uh, the, the, uh, losing an area, losing let's say 10,000 hectares in the tropics, uh, we're losing many more species. And let me give you some examples. Well, we're, we're losing so many species. Well, we're losing uh, African elephant. Now we're losing an Af African elephant illegally every half an hour. There will be no African elephants in the wild probably in 2030, 2035. On, there will be a few left in uh, some reserves unless we stop this uh, massacre. And these are something like that, like uh, we have found around 40% decline of all terrestrial vertebrates in 1970 and 2010. 40%, you know, in 40 years. 76% of freshwater and 40% uh, percent of marine species. That's the magnitude of the problem. And we are coming to this, these uh, things, like uh, uh, I hope you can see these maps. Uh, this is from the paper on the population's extinction. Uh, what you can see, I, I, I like to concentrate just, let, let's say, on, on the maps, the two maps on the middle and on the, on the left. Uh, on the left is the distribution, the distribution of all land vertebrates, 34,000 vertebrates, uh, 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 including mammals, bears, reptiles, and amphibians. And what you can see clearly here is that the tropics in, in uh, America, in Africa, and in Asia, the tropical areas have much more species than uh, areas somewhere else. That means, again, that losing, losing habitat in the tropics, we're losing many more species. Also means that we have to concentrate cons uh, uh, conservation policies in the tropics. And it's also in the tropics where more developing countries are. So you can see here, the, 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 it is uh, up to a, a, more than 900 species of vertebrates in a grid of 100 by 100 a, 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 a kilometers. So then it is incredibly big, the number of species in the tropics, and this is all land vertebrates, these are mammals and these birds. And what's important about these maps is that this is the first time in the history of humanity that we can see in a single map the distribution of all vertebrates. And it's just very, very impressive. And then here are, the, in the middle, the species that are in danger with extinction. And as you can see, it's basically a, a reflection of what's going on in, 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 in the other way. There is a big correlation of areas with high diversity in general with areas of high number of endangered species. So we also have this uh, map, and this was uh, published recently, it was published in 2020, and this is the current distribution of 515 species of vertebrates on the brink of extinction, a species who has less than uh, 1,000 individuals. And what you can see here is basically that uh, it's a species with 5,000 and species with 1,000, most of these species you know, we have very few individuals, very few individuals, 5,000 or 1,000, 5,000 in the top, 1,000 uh, on, on the bottom, are found again in the tropics. So most of the species on the brink of extinction are found in the tropics. So first of all, the tropics had more species than anywhere else. Second, more endangered species are in the tropics. And third, more species on the brink of extinction, meaning that there are really critically in danger are in the tropics. So, what, and then uh, last example, this is a, another, this is part of a study and I give you what we did. This is, uh, we, we measured the range of uh, many species in this particular 177 mammals. And this is like the Varasinga, where uh, we have the, the, the historic and the current distribution. This is the current distribution finding very few places in, in, in Nepal, Nepal and India. And what we have here, what we have see here in this map is that 
uh, 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 in yellow is places where there was no data, and in blue are the places where most, uh, where between 75% to 100% of the populations of the species that we look at were gone. And what we can see again, that if Africa, Southeast well, Asia, Southeast Asia and Asia in general and Southeast Asia are the places where they have lost more populations of more species of these mammals. Just imagine if we can put together, this is only a sample of mammals, but just imagine that we put, could put together all the mammals, all the birds, all the, all the uh, 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 invertebrates. What we're looking here is that we have already lost literally hundreds of thousands or millions and millions of populations in places like uh, Southeast Asia, in places like uh, Mexico, in places like South America. So very quickly, I'm going to finish soon. Uh, um, the diversity, this is very, it shocked me when I saw this paper, that if we measure all the biomass of animals on Earth, 96% is humans and farm animals. Only 4% are the wild animals left on nature, only 4%. And 60% here, in this, 60% are farm animals. And if we look here, you know, at the birds as an example, 70% of all the biomass, of, of, of all the biomass of birds on life as ch are chicken and other poultry, 70%. And 30% is divided by the 11,000 wild species. That's an indication of how massive is our impact on coping land and on coping energy for a wild species. And then we know these kind of things. It's, it's, uh, we have uh, get severe catastrophic losses, like uh, the, the, in this study of animals uh, that were surveyed in Latin America, 94% have been lost in, in, in the, uh, the last uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, in Southeast Asia, it's um, 45%, in Africa, 65%. And I think the data in Southeast Asia is, uh, 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 doesn't represent reality. So what are the drivers of this? Human population is the most important part. As, so, as long as we humans keep on growing, there will be no way we will be able to save biodiversity. There's no way. But unfortunately for us, a population that grows exponentially like that has only two ways to go. One is to uh, stabilize and one is to collapse. So there are clear signs that unless we do something massive to change the way we do business on the world, uh, there could be a catastrophic loss of, of, of uh, uh, humans. And then we know that the forestation is very important and these are some examples that you know perfectly well. This is the, the forest that uh, happened in in Asia, this is Borneo that has been tremendously destroyed in the last uh, few decades. And then animals like pangolin, this, uh, the destruction of pangolin is just uh, overwhelming. And on top of all of this global uh, disruption, we haven't even started to feel the heat of global uh, climate disruption. But when we, when we hit it, when we hit us, uh, full force in the next two decades, it will be horrific. So why do all this matter? Why would you care about these plants and animals species? Why, why? Okay, because there are many, many ways, things, philosophical, religious, ethical, and so on. We should anyway uh, 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 try to preserve species. because are all the benefits that we get from free from, from uh, uh, plants and animals and ecosystems. There could, be, could not be life on Earth unless of that. And one of the, these problems, as we know, is uh, uh, the, the recent COVID uh, epidemic is related to the wet markets of Southeast Asia and, and, uh, and the habitat destruction, Malaysia, Indonesia, China, and so on. We have to stop that. This is madness. And, and uh, in Africa, in Mexico, everywhere is the same. 
So we know that COVID originated from a, unequivocally from a wild species that either directly infected a person or escaped from a lab where were they testing for uh, trying to, to, to do a, a research. And the consumption of wild species is just unthinkable. In China alone, over 100 million individuals, most of them illegally trade, are used every year, generating $74 billion in profit and employing 14 million people. China has to stop this. This is madness, and this is causing the collapse of the civilization. So, as we know, uh, all these species uh, play an important role on maintaining the condition that made possible life on Earth. And uh, I will finish in a couple of slides. 70% uh, of the crops that we use are pollinated by animals. And we're losing those animals, like bumblebees. What can we do? Let's become actors. Let's stop to be spectators. Let's become activists. Let's uh, uh, ask our government, let's ask our corporations, let's ask our uh, citizens to act. Because the good news is that there is still time. But the bad news is the window of opportunity is closing. Thank you very much. Um, I think Prof Tajidin, you're on mute. Uh, I'd like to invite you to um, start the Q&A session. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, the first question, uh, does the mass extinction affect the species? How do we know that species, that they make, they, they make them more prone to They need more room, more area to survive. Elephants need, need more area that, let's say, the, a bat or a mouse. But but in the last few decades, basically, the it, 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 size of the animal, geographic range, the larger the geographic range, the you are social or Or not, you are animal areas, and be, this is because most animals in temperate areas have very large geographic ranges. So there are some trends, the, the uh, uh, biological trends that make some species more vulnerable than others. But because of where uh, our capabilities to uh, kill everything is becoming now uh, 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 worldwide, everywhere in the world. We're losing species and we're losing the species. Okay, uh, this question, uh, members, uh, there is a growing demand on food and increase in farming animal for food. These animals used to be hunted in the wild, but these days uh, we are farming them to keep up with the demand. Uh, for example, seafood, fish, poultry, and cattle. How can farming animal affect the bio? Well, the first thing is we know that the the farm animals are the uh, are uh, impacting uh, biodiversity simply because we are destroying more land to have more cattle, for instance, fish, and so on. Uh, the problem with the, uh, there is very difficult to human population, you know, it's very difficult to have a balance because we will need more and more food. And uh, to, to, to grow that food, we're destroying the habitat using all kinds of pesticides for crops, you know, like glyphosate with a massive uh, uh, impacts on health and biodiversity. We're also uh, using. We're, we, we're releasing the 
we have released in the last 10 years more than 100,000 new chemicals into the uh, environment, and we don't know at all what are the impacts. But we know, for example, that some, some chemicals have the similar structure than uh, uh, female hormones. So many animals, including, for instance, uh, alligators in Florida, are showing, are having more females than males because of these uh, chemicals, or, or more males than females. So eventually, we're disrupting in so many ways the, the, the habitats and the species for our uh, uh, needs for food, but this is uns unsustainable. There is no way we can sustain uh, a growing human population. That's the first fact that we have to understand. Destroying the habitat, we will eventually cause the collapse of civilization. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, female animal, especially uh, for the turtle, since yes. uh, the global warming. Uh, yeah. They were saying they, they are having, they call it hot, hot female. Uh, the, the weather gets hotter and you have a lot of female. For uh, another question, this is uh, too hot to handle, but I wish you could handle it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, our colleague was saying, is it the failure of UCN? Or is it because we, we are working on a wrong model? The, the development model is based on, on the economy. And uh, BioD is always on the bottom of the list. Uh, could you comment on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think, for instance, for not stopping this, because I use I use CN is a tiny organization with almost no resources. I mean, really, what we have to understand than to face this challenge. And and let me let me emphasize that this challenge is the most important challenge that humanity has faced. It's probably only, only uh, similar to a nuclear holocaust. So to solve it, we need to, to have new, uh, uh, global institutions with enough money to, so, to, 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 to do conservation. And so that somebody has done the, the, the calculations. The calculation is around $400 billion a year has to be invested in conservation. So, Oh, 400 billion, that's a lot. That's nothing when you think that the global economy is trillions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And you, when you think and you understand that unless we invest that, the whole thing will collapse. I think that uh, the uh, neo neo neoliberal, being this neoliberal uh, uh, capitalism model is completely wrong. It's wrong because it maximizes the, the uh, catch up and the, 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 the benefits the, the, that we get. So the companies, their incentives are not to think about the future. What, the, the incentive on, uh, and the CEOs will be fired if they don't deliver the maximum amount of money this year. And uh, there are many things we have seen that China has recently said that they're going to stop uh, 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 putting coal factory, coal, coal, uh, 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 processing uh, uh, energy uh, 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 factories in <coughs> outside China, but they will continue inside China. China, the US, the European Union really has to understand that they should be the leaders on putting resources to save the planet because they are the ones causing the problem. <coughs> they are main, the main ones causing the problem, not on okay, the only uh, ones. Professor Garado, Sorry. we have uh, uh, somebody online uh, asking <laughs> question, Mr. Edo Dalinian. Uh, can you turn off? Can you turn on your mic and ask uh, directly to the professor? Thank you, professor. Uh, I'd like to have one question related to the biodiversity loss, uh, especially in marine area. As you know, that increasing demand for the reason. Inadequate uh, law enforcement are also contributing to the biodiversity loss in marine area. 
uh, such as the illegal unreported depletion of resources. But the, the, the main problem that we find in the field is that uh, the main causes of the uh, unregulated fishing is from the ship that uh, is not registered from the particular area such as Indonesia. So for example, it, it, it comes from the another country. Uh, besides, uh, we, we cannot, that, we cannot uh, do the law enforcement towards that kind of ship because we have to maintain the, the, the bilateral um, communication can, and uh, uh, networking can you, with can other you have countries. Your Rather than a statement. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. What is your opinion towards that kind of problem, Professor? Because uh, that's kind of complicated because we have, to, uh, in other side, we have to maintain the uh, connection with other countries, but we have to make sure that the law enforcement uh, is uh, precise in our, in, in our country. So what is your opinion? Thank you. That, thank you. Thank you. That's a good question. That's a problem. I mean, that's a big problem. And Basically, we need, we need, as I said, a global new organization that focus on this and new regulation. For instance, CITES, CITES is, work, is not working any, any longer. Uh, in terms of what you said, then there need to be agreements between nations, you know, and, uh, and but those nations has to be, co be covered by international agreements. Uh, problems with the U.S., but by working together, we have been able to curb somehow it as either we, we donate some of the uh, But what you say and you describe is happening all over the world. And uh, the illegal trade and the, the illegal trade on animals and plants is so ma massive and comparable to uh, arms trading and to illegal drugs. So this is what we need, a completely new order of things to be able to cope. In the meantime, what we can do, uh, like uh, Malaysia or Indonesia, is to do uh, 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 bilateral agreements where, uh, for instance, now we're working together, so the uh, armies or the guards from both countries uh, 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 are looking out for the bad guys, and they uh, uh, we are being uh, successful on, on curbing illegal problems. But it's not easy. What I'm trying to say is not easy because the whole system is designed to do the wrong things. I mean, if you are, you say one of the chips is being caught, probably the fines are really ridiculous, you know, $500 fine and the boat is being uh, released. So uh, what I can tell you is that uh, there is a lot of work to do. There are many ways to do it, but uh, we need to, to uh, in terms like Malaysia and their neighbors, they, they have to cooperate in terms of what is successful, what is wrong and what can be improved. The bottom line is at the end, we can understand that in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Brunei, uh, Singapore, uh, uh, whatever, uh, work together, their citizens will be better off. Even if you forget about the global uh, scenario, working together to save wildlife and biodiversity in Malaysia and in Indonesia and so on will benefit the local people. So that's very important to transmit. What I mentioned at the end of my talk about ecosystem services, that's the most important uh, concept that I have been able to find for convincing the Mexican government and other governments throughout the world to uh, do conservation. They have to understand that by doing better, uh, uh, better conservation, there are more profits and there is uh, more uh, well-being for their people. Right now, they see competition, they see conservation as a something uh, being done by a weird group of people that has no benefit for the country, and they are completely wrong. This is why I call my, 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 my conference uh, the, the Future of Humanity, and we have been able, to, been able to be successful somehow in many cases, showing corporations, showing governments that unless we do better with conservation, the whole thing will collapse. Uh, thank you. There is a question from Indonesia, from the Sri Vijaya 
University from Dr. Arena. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it's a very long question, but I may sum it up. Uh, uh, do you think that we should have uh, sort of uh, 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 some accounting system to take account into the loss of the species? Well, what, what the, I don't know. Most many countries have an accounting system. Well, for instance, IUCN, CITES, and many organizations like that is like an accounting fish eh, 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 system. Uh, in countries like in Mexico, we have the Endangered Species Act. In the U.S. and many other countries, have this accounting system. And for instance, in Mexico has been very good, and in the U.S. and other countries too, because we know what species are recovering, and we know what the species are in danger, and we know then specifically what we have to do. In Mexico, we are trying to impose a, a, a system that will uh, protect, uh, will account not only for species, but also for habitats. It's very important to account for that. And I don't know if Indonesia has an Endangered Species Act or something like that, but if it doesn't, it will be very, very important to have this accounting because then the government, we can demand the government to do something for those species. And I know that in Southeast Asia, the big corporation, there is a lot of corruption because the big corporations come and destroy forests and put palm, palm oil. We need to, uh, but what is very, very bad, and this is in Mexico, I don't, I'm not saying criticizing your countries, but what we know, there are so many areas already, already deforested. Why we destroy the forests that are left? Why don't we use the deforested areas to plant uh, uh, crops? And I give you an, an idea that we are going to try to Mexico. Let's say that we, we have millions of hectares, hectares already deforested of tropical forests in Mexico. Why don't we use those forests those areas to have palm oil or other crops. And planting, let's say, three hectares of the crops and then restoring one hectare of forest. If we have 10 million hectares, at the end we will have two and a half million hectares of, of, of the original forest plus seven million hectares of the, the, the crops. So we need to be, we need to be very creative. We need let me try to emphasize this. We need to show that conservation is an economical decision. That by doing conservation, we are better off in terms of maintaining the stability, the political stability, the social stability, and the economic stability of a country. Because if we continue destroying the resources, there is no way we can, we can maintain the political, the economic, and the social stability. And for instance, one thing we have to do is see what are the forces destroying the, 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 the forests on, on, on your country, like on my country. And then we need to go precisely to that. And we need to do a better job. We need to unite and show that we can do many good uh, economic decisions that will be very profitable by not destroying the forests and then uh, concentrating in places that have been already impacted. Okay, we have... Uh... We have uh, Professor Mazlan, uh, Dr. Rohana, and Dr. Siva asking three questions, but I'm going to sum it up. Okay, uh, we, we are having, uh, we used to have 4,000 tigers in the wild. Now, today, we may have less than 100. And uh, having uh, that sort of rapid decline in the species and population, uh, how will the data collection and sharing will help the management? And how can the people help to save uh, this sort of animal, the large uh, mammal, especially from extinction? Well, that's a, first of all, the, the, the tiger is a species that is, if it's been taken care of, can recover. We know that tiger population can recover really fast because like tigers, like jaguars and other uh, cats, lions, reproduce very well. So they are declining really fast because the illegal trade, what we need to do is in our countries, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, wherever they there are tigers, we enforce the law because most of the tigers are being destroyed 
to be smuggled into into uh, China and other countries, you know, but basically China. So uh, one thing that it has to be done maybe is uh, 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 make agreements with China to try to curb this problem. The COVID-19 can really help us because the COVID-19 originated in China and originated either because the virus escaped from a, a lab where they were doing experiments or because it, it, one of the wet markets, you know. And this is not the first case. It has been many cases. So uh, I think this is a great opportunity that we work with China and reduce the illegal trade because I don't think the world will be able to, to, to survive another pandemic like this. And there will there is no doubt there will be another pandemic like COVID very soon if we continue with illegal trade. So what we can do, we can demand, we can demand our governments to uh, uh, protect the tigers. We can make coalitions of countries to, to, to focus on saving the tigers. And then we can enforce the law. For instance, um, I'm very, uh, uh, if, if we can protect the forest and we can protect the, 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 the stop killing the tigers, the tiger will reproduce. There are, there are not a problem. I mean, there are many species like rhinos who are very difficult to reproduce, but tigers reproduce very well. And one thing I will say to everybody: please, don't 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 buy animal, wild animals as as uh, pets. And if you can stop, if you are used to eat uh, wild animals, please stop eating wild animals. Uh, we shouldn't, we should uh, not promote the use of wild animals and the commerce of wild animals because we were part, then we will be part of the problem. Okay, uh, we have uh, two questions that are interrelated. I'm going to merge it as well from two different persons. Uh, how can uh, we get uh, the really the public support in the uh, developing country? Or can we force the government, we force the government to take care of uh, all the animals? Or are we going to do a co-management? Or are we going to breed some animal to feed for uh, those in the wild or have certain habitat or, or areas for feeding ground and do that sort of uh, manipulation of habitat and so on? to encourage uh, wild population, uh, to re recovery of the wild population, like tiger or elephant. They are doing great job uh, for the wild elephant by planting trees in Borneo. Uh, what is your comment on that? Well, let me tell you that, for instance, uh, um, in places in Africa where there, there was a lot of bush meat, Providing the local people with pigs reduced the the the, the uh, illegal trade by almost ninety uh, percent. So many times the people in places like in Africa is because they don't have another source of protein. I think in places like 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 uh, Southeast Asia is different. In Southeast Asia has been promoted like a, 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 as the population start to have more wealth, it is a, a status of uh, of wealth to eat pangolins and some of these animals. So we're talking about different problems. One is to stop the trade for wealthy uh, companies or wealthy people because they think that uh, they are medicinal, you know, like the, like the, the, the uh, uh, horn, the rhino horn that's supposed to be uh, Afro aphrodisiac, you know, so why don't you use Viagra instead of the rhino horn? But uh, 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 the other part is like, uh, in Mexico, for instance, we work in Mexico, in southern Mexico, in the forest, tropical forest of southern Mexico. We don't stop the, the hunting 100%. We just regulate hunting. We prohibit the uh, uh, hunting for profit. But the local people can hunt. And in 10 years, we have seen places recover jaguars, tapirs, uh, white leaf peccaries, all kinds of animals. They rebound. If we reduce two things, on the one hand, habitat destruction, and the other hand, the use of wildlife for profit, you can recover everything. 
I mean, really, that's, that are the two major, the most important part. There is uh, taking animals for profit should be illegal, completely illegal. And I assure you that in any national park and in any area outside national park that has forests, and uh, 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 we really enforce reducing the killing of animals for profit, most of the species will rebound. I mean, because let's remember that most of these species have been here for millions of years, and they have experienced many, many uh, 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 difficult problems. But at this point, there is no way they can survive habitat destruction, poisoning, hunting, uh, uh, diseases, and so on. There are too many things, too many strong stressors at the same time. But what I can tell you that it has been proved incredibly useful, we have to maintain most habitats as possible inside and outside reserves, you know. Second, we should make habitats outside reserve more friendly to animals. And third, we should stop illegal trade for profit. Uh, there's there uh, one can, hand up. Uh, uh, a friend from University of Kabansan, Malaysia, Dr. Adri, please. Turn on your mic and ask question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Tajudin. Uh, Prof. Gerardo, thank you very much for your input and um, very inspiring work. And I've been uh, scrutinizing your CV, actually, looking at your past, uh, some of, of, the, of the past publication that I've missed. Um, yes, um, I, I totally agree with you on the on the causes of um, habitat loss, which ultimately drives away uh, and 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 uh, uh, drive our species to extinction, right? But the point is, uh, all the the knowledge that you've uh, done, yeah, uh, like Professor Judin here, he has done like almost thirty years of of conservation work. But year in year out, we hear forests being cut. We hear forests being uh, being fragmented, and and uh, losing habitat will we will lose the species, right? So how did you do it? How did you package your your scientific evidence, your scientific findings, uh, to be uh, communicated? Yeah, you, we we uh, I mean the, from all the questions earlier, and including your points, also Prof. Judin's point, we we scream a lot. We 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 consult. Uh, state government, local authorities, federal government to to do this, do that, right? But nothing. I mean, of course, some work, but but majority of the of, of the issue is. Uh, I mean, we we still see a lot of issues there, right? So how receptive? Yeah, how receptive is your government, and uh, do they listen to scientists? Do they take take actions uh, based on your on your recommendation collectively, scientists? How 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 can we do it? Uh, I mean, better, particularly in, in Malaysia and throughout the tropics. Thank this you. This is a very good question. This is a very good question. Uh, basically, what you're saying that is we're losing the battle. We're losing the battle because we're losing species and we're losing habitats. Uh, but it's not our own responsibility because we're a small group of people, you know. And uh, if there is still forest left in Mexico is because of us. If there are forests left in Malaysia, it's because of you. So this is the first thing we have to understand that uh, uh, although we, we haven't been able to do a, a, a better job, it's not because of our responsibility, because we are a small group of people. But that tells us what we have to do. And let me tell you, we first of all, at the global level, and as you see my, my, my publications, I put them in such a way that they have impact the policy. In the last IPBS on a species extinction, they, they cite 52 times my work and the most important graph, they put my graph, the one I show you, they just put, they change some things and they put it there. They quote it, but then everybody's quoting them, not quoting us. It doesn't matter because what I wanted is, it, become, it became that paper an international public policy. Now everybody, is talking about 1 million species extinct and that extinction crisis is important. So what we have to do, the first thing is to try to put our knowledge at the global level or at the national level at the top. In Mexico in the 1990s, I push, uh, I, I, I did a research on endangered species and then I realized that there was no endangered species act in Mexico. 
So I push it and then we managed to have Endangered Species Act and it has been incredibly important to save a species. This is the first thing. Second, we need to understand that we are, that we are, uh, uh, we won't be, we won't do our job if we don't have at least three things. One, we amplify it. We need to amplify it. We need to, for instance, this kind of, of, of seminars are very important, but this kind of seminar has to be done for uh, general people. If you read my papers, you will see that anybody from high school, maybe secondary school will understand them. I don't use any jargon. I don't use any statistics. I try to make them incredibly simple so anybody can understand it. And those papers have been cited by psycho psychologists, sociologists, politicians, and so on. So we need to make our, our, our knowledge accessible to the uh, normal people, non-scientist people, to the government. The, so, so we have to amplify it. The second thing is we need to show the government and the general public and everybody else that we are not competing, a competing interest. What I'm saying is conservation is a decision that is part of an economic decision. I can decide to put this, this area as a, as a crop or I can decide to leave it as a, a, a conservation. And we people working on conservation has to show that conservation is more profitable than destroying. I just read a paper that they show that in the Bahamas, the Bahamas, the shark dive industry leaves uh, millions, more than, I think it's two, $150 million a year. And Bahamas is a tiny place, you know? And, and uh, uh, um, every shark, if you kill it once, it will give you between 30 to $60. Dollars. By keeping it alive in the Bahamas, it, it, it's, it's worth it hundreds of thousands of dollars, one single shark. So the same thing, for instance, in, in, in India, the, the, the tourist industry for seeing tigers is gigantic. So why don't we do the same in Malaysia? For instance, I went to my, my, my only Malaysia, only Sumatra and Borneo has orangutans. Why don't we push the orangutan, the orangutan uh, 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 tourism at such a level that it will be much more worth it to have orangutans than to have a palm oil plantation? And the final thing is like uh, we need to. Uh, 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 in Mexico, we do uh, our success stories are based on two things: on uh, cooperating the world government when it is possible, and and uh, uh, suing the government when it is possible. So sometimes we collaborate, and sometimes we need to push them. But most of the time, uh, right now, we are uh, trying to show that doing conservation, maintaining the forest is better because there will be water, it will be microclimate, there are fruits, there are animals, and so on. And finally, if you do a study in Danum, for instance, what is the, how much is worth it to have an orangutan? Or in Sumatra, how much is worth it to have a, 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 a rhino? You will see that is many, many more time, more profitable than palm oil. So uh, here we will have to face uh, uh, just corruption and to face other things to push it. But uh, the bottom line, we have all now, now all technology, all, all science and technology to show that doing conservation in a proper way, it is much more economically viable than to destroy the forest. Thank you. Okay, very uh, brilliant thank and inspirational. You. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Professor Garado. Uh, we come to the end. Uh, there are a lot more comments there. And uh, yes, I agree with your comment and also with the comment from uh, your colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Rahe Matsha, who was saying uh, in the chat box that uh, we have beautiful plan, but we don't have enough money to execute. So uh, for instance, we plan to have 1000 tigers in Malaysia, but uh, after that plan, we, we have uh, less than 200 tigers in the wild. So what the plan says, uh, but uh, actually we don't have this sustainable uh, financing. And yes, I agree with you that we must have knowledge. This is the uh, difficult part, uh, Prof, because uh, in Malaysia, we have a lot of cyber trooper 
or keyboard expert. So they talk a lot, but they never publish anything in any journal and so on. So yes, uh, we have to have good knowledge so that we can make informed decision and we can advise our planners, our political masters to make good informed decision. So for the young, uh, young scientists and young uh, uh, student, please have good knowledge and write, publish, share your knowledge. Then yes, I agree with you, uh, Professor Sabas, that we have to amplify our knowledge. We must do that. Uh, we have been talking day in, day out. I have been talking the same thing uh, in 1977, I've been written, I've been writing the same thing uh, for the last 40 years and keep on talking about the same subject of conservation. And uh, I, have, I have great respect with the Indonesian. My colleague in Indonesia, you have done a great job. They have one good project, having coffee, at the ground level, they have they plant coffee, but up in the tree, they have gibbon. They managed to conserve a population of gibbon, and they have the local community having coffee down there. So they yeah. have sort of a, a very nice uh, working community, community in Java. Uh, uh, the outfit been run by our colleague, uh, Mr. Wawan, we just had a conversation a few days be, uh, before, and uh, and I said, uh, uh, Mr. Wawan, you must write and you must publish this sort of thing. So uh, we are going to publish that uh, knowledge, how they can engage the community to do that. So they look at the gibbon and also they plant their coffee. So I mean, uh, I mean, the community have the money and the gibbon have the safety uh, to live in the trees. So uh, this is a, a very good way of uh, engaging the community to have the co-management. Uh, the ownership of this animal is not belonging only to the government, but it must be held in trust by the people for our next generation. So if I don't keep the animal now, I won't have that animal in the future for my great great grandchildren or the children that are yet to be born uh, on earth. So by uh, 2020, 20, 50, uh, Professor Gazal Garado have uh, 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 predicted that we are going to lose 515 species, correct? Uh, about that uh, number. And at that point of time, we also have a, almost 10 billion human population. So this is the last question before we close. How are we going to deal with that sort of extinction and with that sort of human being uh, reaching to 10 billion uh, in, a, in, well, in, in, I, in a few years? I really think there is no way we will reach 10 billion. Before that, the population, I mean, and if we, if we don't do something, unfortunately, the population has started to stabilize in some places. But I personally don't think we will be able to reach 10 billion species, 10 billion people. Before that, we will collapse. And I don't think there is time for, for our grandchildren, not even for our children. There is a new report just recently showing that uh, people in places like in Pakistan, in India, and so on, will get 10 times more heat waves than now. And when I was talking to a, a reporter the other day, I said, nobody can live in places like that. Even now, uh, uh, some places in, like for instance, in Panama, that are moving people from, from islands to mainland because they, their islands are being inundated by the sea, sea level. And you cannot live in places where there are 10, 10 times more heat waves because right now it is impossible. So it's very important to understand that if we continue, there, I mean, first of all, there, we, there, there is no way we beat, we beat 10 billion. Much before that, we will collapse. And COVID, 
is a prelude of collapsing. This is what could be the collapse look at, you know? And this is just an epidemic, epidemic. Just imagine many more things. So what we need to understand is what will happen in the next 20 years will define the future of all biodiversity and all on humans. So we need to work really hard in the next 20 years. To, okay, to uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Garrado Sabala. So we are really uh, running out of time. I would like to apologize. Uh, I'm still getting a lot of uh, a question, but uh, we would be grateful uh, for you to come back and uh, talk about uh, other things. And on behalf of the, of the uh, Academy of Science Malaysia, we like to say terima kasih. Thank you very much. And uh, and I uh, pass over this uh, uh, session to the organizer. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Professor Tobias, and thank you, uh, Professor Judin, for moderating. It was indeed a great talk, and we had so many people join us from around the world. Um, so I'd like to thank you again um, for joining us today. Um, this is not the end of these activities. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone here that this is actually a pre-conference event that leads up to our International Conference on Tropical Sciences. Um, so just allow me to just uh, go over that, that conference quickly with you guys. Um, so what this conference is, is it's a virtual conference and it focuses on tropical sciences. Um, and there are four different tracks, um, medicine, agriculture, natural resources. Um, so it's actually quite multidisciplinary. Um, and you can register for this conference uh, now at tropsci2021.com.my. So you can see there's a QR code which you can scan and then I'll put the link later um, in the chat. Um, so if you're interested in, in these subjects, uh, please join us for the conference. At the conference, one of the sessions we'll be having is um, a session on sustainable um, use and management of uh, tropical biodiversity. It will be moderated by our fellow uh, of the Academy of Science Malaysia, Dr. Rangmasa. And uh, we have uh, some um, great panelists that you can uh, look out for. And this week also, we'll have several more events on different topics. Um, we have one actually coming up on uh, this week on 8th of October. So on Friday, we'll be talking to the winner of the 2021 World Food Prize. And we'll be talking about how aquatic, uh, aquatic foods can be uh, uh, sources of nutrition for nations in the tropics. And then on Saturday, 9th October, we have a special webinar on youth and how youth can uh, play a role in creating a sustainable future in the tropics. So to keep updated on these uh, events, feel free to follow our social media. Um, so this is the end of the webinar. Once again, thank you very much um, for joining us from around the world. Um, feel free to get in touch if you have any questions afterwards.